All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, so my name is Stacey, and as Simon said, I'm going to speak to you along with my colleague Robin about the journey that we took migrating the Compare the Market website to the cloud. Uh, so just to introduce ourselves, ourselves, first of all, I'm a technical lead and I've worked at Compare the Market for about two and a half years and I joined the company right around the time that this migration project was just starting to kick off. Um, my name is Robin, uh, I'm an application architect and I joined Compare the Market uh, almost four years ago to the day actually. And yeah, um, we, yeah, we're sure like most of you probably know a little bit about Compare the Market. We're one of the UK's biggest price comparison websites and people usually remember us because we're the ones with the new kind of adverts. Um, Robin and I both work on a team at Compare the Market called the Marketing IT Team. And we're responsible for looking after almost 2,000 pages on the Compare the Market website, including the home page and key product landing pages. So we're basically the front door to the website. So performance and accessibility are very important to us. I'd also like to mention at this time, our team is hiring. We have a couple of software engineering positions open at the moment and CTM, it's a pretty great company to work. We've got lots of cool benefits like personal training budgets, self-learning time and flexible hours. So if you'd like to find out more, please reach out to myself or Robin, or you can go to techjobs.competitormarket.com to see a list of our current vacancies. Tonight, uh, we're gonna to talk to you about the three phases of our migration journey. So first, Robin is going to discuss the problems that we faced at Compare the Market and why we had to do this migration. And so then I'm gonna come back and talk you through our solution, including the infrastructure, the automated testing and performance monitoring that we set up. And finally, Robin will go over what actually happened and the lessons that we learned along the way. So over to you, Robin. Cheers, Stacey. So um, let's quickly run through the initial problem that we actually faced at Compare the Market, one uh, which I'm sure uh, many of you will be very familiar with. Um, so when I joined Compare the Market about four years ago, um, I was facing quite a common problem across many mature businesses. It was typically a big monolithic website full of old code. So it was slow, it was inefficient, and it was not the best for our customers at all. So we as a team, we had a big task ahead of us to improve the existing website, but also then to start planning for the next iteration as well. And um, as you'd expect, uh, there were many challenges uh, ahead of us. So both of, between kind of technical challenges and within the business as well. Firstly, on the tech side, uh, we had a myriad of issues. So too much JavaScript. Uh, so much uh, client-side code had been ha added to the website over the years, much of it unused or unnecessary. Uh, there was no tag management on the site. Uh, so lots of different tags all over the pages doing different things, some technical, some marketing, some advertising, some analytics, you name it, it was probably all there. Um, and of course, this leads to far too many requests of files on the page. And by files, I mean that can be anything from images to CSS to JavaScript frameworks to custom JavaScript and then all those lovely tags that I mentioned before as well that were littered all over the site. And uh, as for CSS, there was just way too much of it. Um, it was built in such a way that there was one global CSS file for the home page, the landing pages and the hundreds of content pages, meaning that the users were often loading in uh, loads of style sheets uh, that were redundant for the page that they wanted to view anyway. Uh, images too were often way too big, not optimized at all, which in some cases added a huge amount to the overall page load. And then the business also uh, gave us challenges, as you'd expect. So particularly that we had to kind of compete against all the other priorities that our team would usually be dealing with. So we had to prove that improving the code base, making the site more performant is actually a worthwhile thing to do. So for this, uh, we needed to get concrete figures as to the impact of actually improving performance on our pages, things like better bounce rate, better click-through rates as KPIs that we were kind of aiming at. And the range of stakeholders as well that we needed to convince um, was across loads of different areas in the business. So especially across marketing as well. So organic SEO, uh, PPC ad teams, we got campaign teams. So teams that are working on those TV adverts, um, we've got PR teams that are working on getting links from newspapers and, and different sources. So we had to prove to each of these stakeholders that the cost of all the engineers working on this stuff was definitely going to be worthwhile for them. And then because we needed tag management, we 
we had to go out and find a product to do that as well. So there was all the red tape you get in any big business to actually evaluate the product and then negotiate and then get it signed off. And that's before you even start the implementation, which obviously for something like that is not trivial at all. Luckily though, uh, we have a really good culture of innovation at Compare the Market. So in our team, we're always spiking new technology in our sprints and exploring new ways of doing things. And uh, we also have monthly innovation days throughout new tech and even things that have absolutely nothing to do with our product whatsoever. So back, oh, blimey, quite a while ago now, back in December 2016, I think it was, we had that quiet week between Christmas and New Year and um, we had an innovation sprint uh, for the two or three of us that were left in the office. And we had a look at Google's um, AMP project, uh, which was uh, kind of quite buzzy at the time. And it was recommended to us by a head of SEO, uh, kind of as a possible shortcut to improve page speed um, within uh, search results. So it seemed like an interesting thing to look at. And so over that week, we kind of did a proof of concept based on our pet insurance landing page. We hard coded it really quick and dirty. And then after Christmas, once our stakeholders had approved it, we put it out live as a test. And the results were ridiculous. We saw a bounce rate of about 10%. Um, and out of those that didn't bounce, there's a click-through rate through to the pet insurance journey of about 90%. Um, and our business stakeholders absolutely love this, obviously. It kind of gave them the, uh, the KPIs that, that we were looking for, uh, that kind of showed that uh, speed was a useful thing. And it, it, you know, it really helped to prove that speeding things up and making the code cleaner and faster will actually help the bottom line. So we then went away and coded that properly. Uh, this time in MVC, creating lots of different content blocks in our content management system. And so it meant that the content editors could then uh, go away and create lots of basic amps in the CMS and publish them live without any extra coding needed from us. And they, they did that, they beaved away for the next few weeks and months and uh, made loads of little slim down amps for our key landing pages and content pages. And these are mostly the same as their canonical counterparts, but with without such a heavy navigation, we got this great big kind of what we call a mega nav on our website. So without, without anything like that, removing any of the more dynamic content from the page, mostly due to restrictions at the time with AMP's framework actually. Um, but anyway, AMP pages aside, uh, what else could we do to the rest of the website? Um, well, I'm sure given that this is the London Web Performance Meetup, um, most of you on the call will actually know the basics of site optimization. So I won't get into too much detail, but we did all the obvious stuff that was recommended at the time. So on the slide here, I've actually got what was the recommended stuff in kind of 2017 that we had gleaned from, uh, from across the net. And uh, although we didn't do it in that order, but we prioritized things like making visible content uh, a priority then putting critical CSS above the fold then deferring the rest. And then we made sure all the JavaScript was either async or deferred to the bottom of the page, made sure it was all minified and bundled up. Um, put in some image optimization in our CMS so that all the images uploaded by our content editors were actually crunched. And then after this, we, um, we worked on uh, our caching strategy to push out cache times on the client so they were a lot longer. And then finally, we put in a few resource hints and things like that to prefetch some, some of the uh, bits and bobs on the site. And this kind of kept the wall from the door uh, while we figured out what we were actually going to do uh, to build for the long term. And for that bit, I'm going to hand back to Stacey. Uh, thanks, Robin. Uh, yes, yeah, so after we implemented the quick wins that Robin spoke about, uh, we've taken it as far as we could and we managed to convince the business that we needed to build a newer, sparklier, better version of the website. So that's what we named it. We called it Project Sparkles and we moved from an on-premise solution to AWS in the cloud. So this would give us the flexibility to create temporary instances for testing new features, as well as the ability to automatically scale up the live website during periods of high traffic. Uh, we kept the same CMS solution, so it meant we were still using C-sharp for our backend, but this time we built our application using the MVC framework instead of web forms. And after the initial success that we had with AMP, we continued to use it, but instead of having to maintain two sets of code, and content, one for AMP and one for non-AMP, we went for an AMP-first approach this time. So basically, we took AMP's performance principles as our baseline. Uh, we have a single page with a query string parameter, question mark AMP, to work out how the page is rendered. 
So without the query string, you'll get the regular canonical version of the page with all the bells and whistles. But when you add question mark amp to the query string, we'll remove any kind of custom JavaScript or anything else that's not considered valid amp. But the same CSS and a lot of the same HTML is shared across both views. So that means there's less code for developers to maintain. And there's a single source of content for our content team to update in the CMS. And also the amp limit of 75 kilobytes of CSS per page forced us to be selective about what styles we're including and reduces the amount of unused CSS we're loading on any given page. So let's talk a little bit about how we set up our CI testing and our development workflow. So we start with a master branch, which always reflects the production ready state. And then we branched off master to create feature branches. Uh, once a developer has completed a piece of work, they'll raise a pull request, and then this will trigger our CI to spin up a new EC2 instance in AWS. So it creates an environment where the code from that feature branch can be tested. And we, we use this for our suite of automated tests that we run by our CI, but also we can share this link with other stakeholders who may want to manually review and sign off for changes before they go into production. It also gives developers who are reviewing the code changes an opportunity to test the new feature in their browser without needing to go and check out the feature branch in their own development environment. So if an engineer has approved a pull request and all our automated tests are passed, we can be confident that this new feature is ready to be released and then the branch can be merged and sent on its way up to production. So what kind of automated tests are we running in these PR environments? We've got C Sharp and JavaScript unit tests are running using XUnit and Jest, and any failing tests or code coverage falling below a certain threshold will block PRs from being merged. And we also use SonarCube and ESLint to maintain code quality standards. We will run integration tests using Newman to test our APIs. We run UI and visual regression tests using Apple tools and source labs to ensure the site looks and behaves as expected across different browsers and devices. And we also use check marks at OWASAP for our security checks to make sure we don't introduce any vulnerabilities in our code. We also run automated checks to make sure we stay within our performance budgets. And this is how we limit the amount of code and assets we're adding to the site and ensure our site performance isn't regressing over time. So our performance budgets could be split into three main areas. We've got quality-based metrics, which are focused on the browser experience. And this is based on raw values, like how much JavaScript in kilobytes you have on the page or the number of HTTP requests you have. And then there's paint-based metrics, which are timings based on the user's experience loading a page. So this is things like time to first buy, first contentful paint, and time to interactive. And then third, we've got the score-based metrics, like Lighthouse scores, page speed index scores, best practice and accessibility scores. So how do we test against these? For weight-based budgets, we use LightWallet. Uh, so limits are configured in a budgets JSON file where we can specify the maximum size for each resource type. So for example, we can set a 300 kilobyte limit for all scripts. Um, and we can also set resource counts. So we can budget, say, 10 requests made to third party origins. And our CI will run lighthouse tests against our site and then the pipeline will fail if we exceed any of these budgets. Um, to test our paint and score budgets, we use a service called Calibre. And Calibre uses Lighthouse in a controlled environment. So for each test of a page, it will spin up a new instance, then it, create, it tests your page three times and records the average. You can then set budgets within Calibre for timing. So for instance, we're tracking first contemporary paint, time to interactive, speed index, and our overall Lighthouse performance score. And we have budgets set for each of these. And we've also been experimenting with integrating Calibre into our CI CD. So we'll create a snapshot when a new pull request is opened and compare that against the baseline snapshot. It comments on the pull request and so it allows you to see the performance impact of development work before it gets released. We also use Calibre to monitor the performance of our live website at various intervals throughout the day. And this gives us a good idea of how we perform across different products like our homepage, key landing pages, insurance product forms and reward offerings. Uh, it also allows us to see how we stack up against our competition. So we can track all this information and store it and see what's happening over time, giving us a clear picture of when things change, not just on our website, but also when our competitors get faster or slower. And if Calibre notices any dips in our page performance, we've set it up so it will notify the team on Slack. 
right, I'm going to hand back over to Robin now to talk us through how the migration panned out. So what happened? Uh, well, amazingly, it actually went fairly smoothly, thanks to that. Um, although we, we were given a decent amount of time and space by the business to kind of follow a true agile approach and build it iteratively without any kind of major deadlines. But that said, we did naturally hit some quite interesting bumps in the road uh, on this little journey. So, I mean, the first tricky thing was how to operate two websites on different CMSs in different infrastructures without the customer noticing and without any changing of the URL structure. So um, the key to this was how our old on-premise CMS was routed to via an application delivery controller made by Citrix called NetScaler. Um, it was at this point, we had existing rules and features uh, that filtered traffic before it went to our old CMS, such as redirecting Australian-based customers over to our Aussie uh, franchise credit market. Um, and uh, what we were able to do here was create rules that specified that for certain URLs that NetScaler should send traffic over to our new Sparkle solution in the cloud. So um, rather than to our, um, our old on-premise CMS. So uh, however, the more rules you have in place, of course, the longer the filter becomes and uh, you can end up slowing things down for everyone. So you've got to be quite careful as to how uh, you organize a migration like this. Therefore, uh, we worked closely with our various teams in Capella Market to create the content to find the best order to migrate everything in. We sliced everything into pillars based on the URL structure that they sat under and tested our first release of the pet insurance landing page. Um, so just, just one rule in Netscaler to redirect it up to the Sparkle CMS. Um, and after we were comfortable that this page was performing as expected, and we ironed out a few small issues with traffic analytics, uh, anyone that's worked with AMP a lot will know that that can be quite fun, um, we, we pushed on. And, um, and then over the next several months, we added the uh, uh, added to the NetScaler rules with various kind of high traffic landing pages, such as car insurance, travel insurance, home insurance, and so on. And then the most busy page of them all, the home page. And this gave us a really good idea of how well the site handled load as well. So did we cache everything well enough to deal with the spikes of traffic? And yeah, we actually we did, uh, now that we were a nice clean code base you know, better infrastructure and we could auto scale. So after this, we grabbed entire pillars to move across. Um, and we used PET as the guinea pig again, excuse the pun, but we moved that one across first by adjusting the existing rule that we had for PET uh, with a wildcard sitting on top of it. And then we repeated this for all the content across the site. Uh, once the content editors had worked through building them in, in the priority order that, that we had set out with them. However, for many of the more kind of wacky content pages that we had, uh, and we do have quite a few various quizzes and games and things. I uh, have lots of custom JavaScript. We didn't really have the time to completely rebuild everything from scratch. Our stakeholders, unfortunately, weren't that patient. So we had to cut a corner slightly and build a content scraper. Now, this isn't something we wanted to do at all. Obviously, as engineers, we wanted to build everything perfectly, make lots of lovely little components. But, um, and when we originally planned on the, the, doing the project, we plan to build all of these kind of more flamboyant pages on the site properly, but we just didn't have time. So again, we had an innovation day for the whole team to find out the best way to actually speed all this up. And the result was they designed and built a content scraper. So it was just a small node application that grabbed all the HTML sat after the hero banner and before the footer on uh, every single kind of page, content page that we, we pointed it at. And then it spat it out in JSON format for our content editors to copy and paste all the relevant chunks of metadata and HTML, CSS, and any, uh, any JavaScript into the CMS rather than having to build a page from scratch so they could just grab the whole lot and dump it into a field in the CMS. The main drawback here though, obviously, is that the scraped HTML, well, at first it wouldn't be AMP compliant, meaning none of these pages could be cached AMP. Uh, you, you wouldn't have that counterpart um, to the canonical. Um, and uh, obviously the HTML would, in some places wasn't that great. Uh, however, the good news is that many of these pages have since been cleaned up uh, by our very patient content editors who have kind of gone, gone along afterwards, gone through all these pages and, and been built properly, uh, leaving only a few pages left that are more complicated ones that are still left on the site and we'll probably get to them eventually, I would think. And then once you've moved um, all the pages across, we then had to reroute away from our old infrastructure. Um, and we thought this would be a really simple job right at the end of, of the project where you know, we just update 
the records in uh, in Route 53 in AWS, um, and uh, and then pop up to Cloudflare, who acts as CDN for for our site. And then it sh you know there should just be a, a something in in Cloudflare you think just to redirect away all the uh, Australian traffic that we mentioned before. Yeah, no, no, no there wasn't. Um, which came as a bit of a surprise. Um, so it ended up being quite a lot more con convoluted than that. And we had several weeks of fine tuning the routing to make sure we covered all uh, different edge cases and possibilities. And then we had to rebuild the Australian redirection service as a worker in Cloudflare um, to filter all the traffic that came through to the site. But once we'd done that, it did mean that we had uh, time to take a closer look at uh, some of the kind of networking and certificate sides of things that, um, that we could now do, that we were off the older um, infrastructure. And there were a few nice little things in Cloudflare as well, which were quite handy. So the first thing, uh, something that um, Matt mentioned in the previous talk was TLS 1.3. So we, we activated that uh, and that was really simple to do in Cloudflare. Um, and that gave us a nice little performance bonus, uh, plus obviously the added security uh, upgrade as well. And then we actually downgraded our certificate uh, from an extended validated uh, down to a domain validated. Uh, now that that lovely green bar of trust isn't quite so prevalent anymore, uh, it seemed like a good time to do this. So um, that actually gave us a pretty decent performance boost actually around something daft like about 400 milliseconds on a, on a decent 4G connection. Uh, so that was, a, that was a really nice little win. And we've also flicked the switch on a couple of um, other bits and bobs on Cloudflare as well. One of them, the image compression feature called Polish. And what that does is that adds uh, a layer of compression to the images that you've probably already compressed, but it gives it maybe lops about another 10% off. But it also adds a WebP version of any images that you've, uh, like a lot of our images on our site are PNGs or JPEGs. So it, um, it offers the client a WebP version if the client can handle it. So that's actually been a pretty useful little performance boost as well. But did we reach our goals? Uh, second. Now we had quite a few goals for Sparkle's project um, that we outlined in our initial inceptions when we kicked off. Um, and these encompass, encompass kind of four key areas. So number one, that it's faster and more accessible for the customer. Number two, that it's more flexible and efficient uh, for our content creators. Number three, that it performs better for the business, obviously. And uh, number four, that it's better from an engineering standpoint. Um, and on the first goal, we set ourselves quite tough targets for performance. So we wanted over 85 Lighthouse score on 4G on a Moto G4 phone, so fairly average phone. Um, and under a second for first and temporal paint, under about three seconds for speed index, and under four for time to interactive. Um, and then we also set ourselves target um, for all our pages to have a lighthouse accessibility score of 100. Um, and then we also laid on top of that uh, uh, double A in WCAG 2.0 as well. Um, and how do we do? Well, the clean AMP pages, so the, the valid uh, AMP that Google can cache if they want, absolutely smash those uh, speed scores completely. But the, the non-clean, so the, the non-valid AMP pages um, are there or thereabouts. So uh, we kind of around those figures, but for some pages it's not, some pages it is. Um, a lot of that depending on how much is in our tag management system. So we're kind of a little bit beholden to the third party stuff. So I think uh, again, harking back to what Matt was talking about, about the uh, coalescing and uh, HTTP2, which we're actually, we're switching on tomorrow morning, funnily enough. Um, is uh, is going to be of interest in proxying in those third parties. So uh, that's definitely going to be something we're looking at because we're getting hit by the third party stuff. Um, uh, accessibility, about 90% of our pages, uh, we hit that target, which is great. And um, we're still refining the few remaining scraped content pages uh, that score a little bit lower. But we're nearly there, nearly, nearly there. Um, second goal is definitely way more flexible for our content editors. Um, to build pages. Now, uh, previously in our old on-prem CMS, they had uh, hundreds of different fixed content blocks. So you'd have like one with an image on the left and text on the right, and one with an image on the right and text on the left, stuff like that. But the new Sparkles one is much more, much, much more flexible. So they could put things pretty much where they want to on the page um, in a kind of a bootstrap grid-like system. So it's definitely more flexible. Um, however, 
it's not as fast for them necessarily to create that uh, that content because it's not such a fixed system. So they've got more flexibility, but uh, it's a bit of a trade-off with how fast it is to build pages. Um, third goal, we absolutely smashed. Um, the site's performing much better in Google from an SEO point of view. Um, and also way better from a digital ads perspective, mainly because the quality score goes through the roof when you've got uh, PPC amps, which is quite useful. Um, and the click through to products from our landing pages and homepage is performing better by uh, several percentage points uh, due to several factors. Obviously there's loads of those that have nothing to do with this. So obviously UX and the design, the content being written and the speed of the pages all combine into that. So we can't say that it was purely down to sparkles, but we like to think it's a decent chunk of that. And finally, our fourth kind of more internal goal to make it better for the engineers is also pretty successful, we think. Um, the code is lovely and clean now. Uh, the release pipelines are super fast compared to our old on-premise pipelines. Um, and the test coverage is excellent. And it gives us a great springboard to uh, build from. Um, but it's easy to look back on, on any long project with 2020 vision. And uh, if we did do that, what would our main thoughts be? Well, the obvious one is the can of worms that was using AMP as a front end framework. Uh, and while we did manage to kind of crack a lot of the issues that arose while building it, and there were quite a few quite, quite tricky ones to solve, um, we had a few hairy uh, kind of situations uh, that scared us, mainly around bugs released to production in the AMP code base. So um, it's not happened for a few months now, which are probably just completely jinxed us, and it probably happened like now. Um, but uh, yeah, we've, there's been like three times, I think, when the site was completely broken in IE11, um, which accounts actually for about 3% of our customers still. Um, and then there was also once when AMP images were broken for all browsers. Uh, and the bizarre thing about this was that in two or three of those situations, we were actually the first ones to spot it and raise it uh, with the AMP project and with uh, Google engineers themselves. Um, but the, the, the impressive thing is though, uh, is that they were able to actually turn around fixes really fast on things that we raised. Um, but that said, I'm quite looking forward to being able to self-host uh, stable versions of the AMP libraries, which uh, they announced a few weeks ago, that's gonna be possible fairly soon. Uh, so we'll have a little bit more control over the dependencies. Uh, aside from this though, I think most of our other kind of hindsight things would be around people. Um, Firstly, migration projects like this can be quite dull once the majority of the coding's done, and uh, especially in the last few months. Uh, so it was really important for us to keep a few interesting tickets um, in each of the sprints alongside the migration work. Um, and also to make sure that after we finished, the team had a bit of time to celebrate and reflect on the project before we kicked off anything new. We didn't want to jump straight into the next thing because um, that would have been a bit, a bit cruel. Um, secondly, uh, in any kind of long engineering project, the staff turnover uh, can be quite tricky. And given the average time spent at a company for an engineer in London, it's what, 18 months probably. Um, and when your project lasts that long, in fact, I think it was a three or four months longer than 18 months, um, you'd be very lucky to finish with the same team you started with. So in fact, I think on Sparkles, we had in total 28 people uh, across engineering, BAs, tech leads, delivery managers, SDETs, et cetera, that have worked on the project in a team that on average had about 14 people in it. So we had quite a, quite a churn. Um, and this meant we kind of needed to make sure that the team was always well versed in all the areas of the project. Uh, it doesn't matter what it was, be it front end stuff, the back end, the infrastructure, the migration strategies, the performance tuning, everything we needed to make sure that, you know, as people rolled on and off the project that everyone has kind of kept up to speed. And then lastly, there's all the stakeholder management stuff. So keeping everyone's expectations realistic throughout a long project can be challenging as well. Uh, luckily, we got really good uh, relationships with our main stakeholders in SEO and PPC and in engineering as well. So they kind of understood why we were building it the way that we were and the benefits that they were likely to see from it. Uh, um, I suspect that without a good collaboration between our team and the stakeholders, the project could have ended up rushed and be nowhere near as effective as it, it ended up being. Um, and that's, that's everything from us. Uh, so hopefully that wasn't, uh, wasn't too uh, boring.
boring and kept you interested. Uh, so thank you very much from myself and Stacey. Uh, Thank you.